Dear organizers, dear participants, dear guests, I feel very much honored on behalf of the Consortium National Geoinformational Center that I have the opportunity to open uh, the first international conference on environmental protection and disaster risk. My name is Petra Trifonova and I'm project coordinator of the newly developed scientific infrastructure named National Geoinformation Center which is financed by the National Roadmap for Scientific Infrastructure of Bulgaria. Organizing this conference, our aim, our aim was to find a way to gather and present in one place the results that scientists working on the project have achieved. And because to organize a conference is not an easy task, we were very happy uh, that we found a partner in the face of the national program environment to do this together. We are very grateful also to several uh, very enthusiastic colleagues like Nina and Georgi, who spent a lot of efforts to make this meeting happen. We highly appreciate it also the efforts of the people working here in the Center of Crisis Management and Disaster Response for hosting this event. Before launching the conference, I would like to thank, to thank all the authors uh, for respecting our conference and for choosing it as a place to promote their scientific research. And I wish everyone fruitful work, successful presentation, and I hope that uh, this will be just the beginning of a series of uh, very successful scientific events. Welcome all and see you later. Dear participants of this uh, uh, very important conference, which is devoted to environment, uh, environment, environmental protection and uh, disasters, uh, I wish on behalf of the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences uh, to congratulate you and to wish you a very fruitful work. Uh, congratulations <coughs> are particularly important in this moment because uh, we are all passing through a very difficult moment for, for the humanity, but even in this uh, very important, uh, in this very hard moment, uh, uh, you, the participant in the conference, uh, will address very uh, key issues which are related to how to protect the environment and how to cope with the uh, disasters that appear uh, in the world. Um, in the, we are also very happy in the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences that several of our institutes are involved in, in the projects that are uh, organizing this uh, conference. And, uh, as a scientific, uh, the National Scientific Center of Bulgaria, and we are glad that we can contribute uh, with our expertise uh, to the development of scientific methods to, to deal with the um, the issues of your conference. I'm sure that during this conference you will have the opportunity to share a lot of experience that you have accumulated during the years and that uh, this will help uh, uh, increase the level of uh, our expertise to cope and to deal with the difficult uh, issues that are related to uh, the quality of our life and in the future. So I wish you a very, very fruitful conference once again, on behalf of the Bulgarian, Bulgarian Academy of Sciences. Thank you. Dear organizers, dear participants, uh, dear guests, uh, first of all, please allow me on behalf of the Crisis Management Disaster Response Center of Excellence to thank you to National Geographic Information Center and Bulgarian Academy of Science for that opportunity to, to have a joint event uh, of uh, that important field as environmental risk. Uh, first of all, I would like to just uh, some words for our center and uh, uh, to uh, introduce what, uh, why we are working in this field. Since, uh, since our accreditation, the CMDR CUE devotes effort to address the importance of understanding disaster management processes and trace awareness of the latest development related to disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. In the beginning of uh, uh, 
2017, we organized and co-hosted United Nations ISDR training of trainers for the implementation of uh, Sendai framework, uh, which uh, we consider as particularly successful and attract more than 50 experts in disaster management. In addition, in our curriculum, we have disaster management course, and with each iteration, the interest in the course increases. Our team follows the latest processes and most recent development within disaster management discipline by working in close collaboration with United Nations ISDR, United Nations Orchard, and General Directorate Fire Safety and Civil Protection of the Bulgarian Ministry of Interior. In this way, we provide the best possible product and ensure the content of the course is up to date. This year, we increased our involvement in disaster management domain with two important initiatives. The first was in the beginning of 2020, when a team of our experts took part in a joint educational initiative with Allied Joint Force Command Naples and the United, Cent United States Center for Excellence in Disaster Management and Humanitarian Assistance, providing humanitarian assistance response training for Joint Force uh, uh, Center Naples experts in that field. It was three days operational level training course on foreign humanitarian assistance and disaster response operation. The second important initiative of our center was the involvement in California University Online Education on Crisis Management and Disaster Response course intended to provide students with an international study of CMDR field drawing extensively on NATO resources. Some of our experts took part in this course being lecturers on some of the essential topics providing basic knowledge on NATO crisis management fundamentals, NATO crisis response system, and its complementary elements, crisis response process, civil emergency planning, and operations planning, general awareness of civil preparedness, and resilience in a collective defense and deterrence context. Acquisition of uh, knowledge to minimum standards for national resilience, NATO baseline requirements, and basic criteria for evaluation of resilience across all the requirements in order to assess their achievement. In a rapidly changing world, states are facing several security challenges. The interactions between political, so social, technological, and environmental trends is redefining the global security context. Environmental issues are dominated by climate change. That is the reason, in 2018, our center to start conducting the climate change and security course jointly with the European Security and Defense College and the Diplomatic Institute of Sofia. The Earth's climate is changing. Changes to the climate impose stresses on current ways of life, on individuals' abilities to subsist and on government abilities to keep pace and provide for the needs of their populations. Climate change may also lead to increasing incidents of natural disaster which will have an increasing impact, particularly in those areas unaccustomed to such events. The overwhelming consensus is that our planet is facing a massive risk that undermines the national and international security. The intersection of climate change and the national security will be a reality in years ahead. Climate change is the new modern war that can have several direct or indirect consequence. Conflict, instability, unrest, capacity, poverty, health problems, migration, counties, collapse, dependency are some of them. I would like to stop uh, uh, on that point and uh, would like uh, to give more time for uh, all our uh, lecturers and uh, to give their opinion uh, of uh, uh, the conference. I would like uh, again to success uh, our co-organizers and uh, uh, with success and, and uh, also to wish uh, good luck uh, to all of you. I would uh, uh, like to give the floor on the next uh, keynote speaker. Please, Professor. Good morning to everybody. Unfortunately, uh, I cannot see you, but maybe you uh, can see me. Uh, welcome to our conference. Uh, it's uh, partially inspired by the National Research Program Environmental Protection and Minimization on Unfavorable Events and Natural Disasters and Hazards. Uh, this uh, very good uh, initiative of the Bulgarian government uh, Mm, aiming at uh, somehow 
joining the efforts of uh, uh, the research community of people of different scientific background, especially in studying these important issues. The general ob objective of the program is to carry out fundamental and applied studies aiming at uh, ensuring a sustainable, favorable, and safe living environment for the population of the Republic of Bulgaria. And uh, <coughs> this program has both uh, fundamental and uh, fundamental and applied objectives. The fundamental uh, studies uh, which are planned to be carried out in the, uh, within this program is the development and uh, adoption of methods and carrying out a reliable, comprehensive and detailed studies of the special temporal variability of the parameters of the atmosphere and their impact on quality of life, health risk, and ecosystem status, quality of, of waters, and their impact on quality of life, health risk, and uh, ecosystem status, quality of urban environment, building transport, technical infrastructure, uh, infrastructure etc., and their impact on quality of life, uh, and the same things. And very important, uh, it's recurrence in uh, special distribution of extreme, unfavorable, and catastrophic uh, natural events like uh, storms, droughts, hail, floods, floods, fires, sea waves, soil erosion, etc., and their connection with the atmospheric processes and climate changes, uh, performing risk assessment and evaluation of the possibilities for forecast, early warning, and pre prevention of these uh, unfavorable events. Uh, again, about the fundamental studies, is study of the geological environment and geological hazards. Again, it's uh, temporal special distribution, risk assessment, etc. Hazards for biodiversity and ecosystem. Uh, all of this complex interaction between the different spheres, uh, atmosphere, lithosphere, hydrosphere, and that's uh, something very important. Uh, in addition to this, uh, some applied studies are planned, which is uh, elaboration based on the fundamental knowledge uh, achieved uh, of systems for forecasting of uh, unfavorable, unfavorable and catastrophic
advanced computing and, di and data processing. Uh, it's a, a center of excellence and the National Geoinformation Center, which is subject of the National Roadmap for Scientific Infrastructure, National Center for High Performing and Distributed Computing, again, the subject of the National Roadmap for Scientific Infrastructure. And now, very briefly, the work packages uh, in this program, which will give you a more detailed uh, idea of what uh, we are going to to do or uh, are already uh, doing uh, uh, within this program. Uh, the, the work packages are as follows. A regional local scale characteristic of the climate of the country, uh, including, of course, some climate change assessments, water balance and water resources, quality of the national water resources, surface and uh, groundwater, Process and marine uh, process, marine ecosystems, uh, ecological quality, functions, resources, uh, and services in the Bulgarian Black Sea coastal zone. Uh, quality of life uh, in the country again uh, studied in the context of the expected climate changes. Models of ecosystem response resulting from the catastrophic events in the past. That's what. Uh, that's not uh, so much uh, applied study, but uh, will give us knowledge about the interaction between different systems uh, which form the environment. Biodiversity ecosystem. Ah no. Biodiversity, ecosystem functions, and environmental quality. Again, everything is in the context of the climate changes. Assessment of uh, risk of adverse, catastrophic, atmospheric, and hydrographic phenomena. Uh, assessment of the risk of uh, adverse, catastrophic, geological, including hydrogeological uh, phenomena. Uh, catastrophic earthquake risk and uh, consequences. These are the so-called thematic work packages. We also have two uh, horizontal uh, work packages which link all the other. It's uh, creation of integrated geoinformation environment and public presentation and uh, communication of the scientific results to the society during the program and uh, after uh, the program is finalized. That's all about uh, this program which I wanted to tell you. And I have a, uh, one more brief presentation about uh, one of our uh, important partners. As you know, uh, or you certainly know that a lot of the studies uh, in this uh, national research program are performed uh, in the terms of uh, computer simulations and very often uh, the computer resource requirements of the models we are using are um, uh, pretty demanding uh, so uh, we really need very large and up-to-date uh, computer facilities to perform our studies. That's why I'm going to very briefly again present, uh, present the Center of Excellence in Informatics uh, uh, and uh, Communication Technologies, which is uh, our, uh, one of our national centers of uh, excellence. Uh, uh, it's uh, funded through the Operational Program Science and Education for Smart Growth with a total uh, amount of funding uh, more than 15 million euro, 85% uh, uh, of which is provided by the European 
regional development fund and 15% is uh, national funding. Most of the project uh, costs are allocated to building scientific uh, infrastructure, mostly of course uh, computer infrastructure. The partners are the Institute of uh, Information and Communication Technologies, which is the leading organization, Institute of uh, Mathematics and Informatics, Institute of Mechanics, National Institute of Geophysics, Geodesy and Geography. These are institutes of the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences. And uh, uh, in addition, the Plovdiv University, the Medical University Sofia, and the uh, University of Library Studies and Information Technologies. Associate partners are the Technical uh, University in Vienna and Fraunhofer uh, Institute. We, ha um, we also have uh, industrial partners, which are listed here, different companies. Um, so, uh, one of the most important things in this uh, program is uh, uh, not really creation, but enhancing and development of the Center for uh, high performance computing and big data. Here are some uh, uh, some plant parameters of this uh, of this infrastructure. As you see, a lot of uh, storage is planned, which is very important because, uh, especially some of our uh, studies uh, generate uh, an enormous um, quality of data, quantity of course. Uh, so without this uh, computer facilities, uh, it will not be possible to to accomplish our our work. Uh, <coughs> this is. Uh, 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 a picture and some technical characteristics of the newly built infrastructure. Uh, I'm not going to to read all this, but you can see that uh, the computer facilities already available are indeed uh, uh, very large. And here are some pictures which uh, illustrate different applications which are expected to be achieved by this uh, newly developed infrastructure. Again, you can see uh, different uh, illustrations for different applications in uh, material sciences, environment, uh, energy, biology, uh, and uh, within this uh, center of excellence, there are several uh, research uh, projects. Uh, advanced computing and big data algorithms, tools and services. Mesh algorithms and software tools for large-scale simulations of high-tech materials and processes. Efficient methods and algorithms for Monte Carlo simulations, sensitivity analysis and stochastic optimization, language and uh, content technologies for the data solutions, variations, variational and statistical methods for digital science and engineering, ICT approaches to modeling and simulation of uh, dynamic processes in industry with uh, web-based applications and new services and productions and products and development and application of mathematical models and numerical methods for transport and coupled uh, processes associated with mechanics and uh, me uh, mechatronics and uh, biomedical applications, 
advanced computing and analysis of the climate changes impact, a very uh, close connection with uh, our uh, program, mathematical modeling uh, and advanced computing in drug design and bioinformatics, future we web and wireless technologies, data analysis and modeling with applications, conceptual modeling and simulation of s smart ecosystems. Very briefly, these are the tasks of this uh, Center of Excellence, which is uh, connected with the, our national research program and uh, quite an important prerequisite for achieving our goals. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everybody, from my side. Um, I would like to say that with this uh, time slot, our conference is open. And uh, from now on, uh, is going to be our keynote speakers. Uh, thus, please, the keynote in five minutes, the keynote speakers, please uh, log in to your WebEx links. And the rest, please watch us on YouTube.
Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, Roberto, uh, you're with us, yes? Hello, hello. So, uh, with some delay, we will start with our keynote speaker, um, Professor Roberto San Jose. Uh, for uh, this participation, in particular by all friends, Dimitri Sirakov and Maria Prodanova, from many, many, many years in the past. So, my presentation today is titled The Use of Less CFD Urban Models and Mesoscale Air Quality Models for Urban Air Quality Simulations. Um, in this presentation, we are going to talk about uh, the city of Madrid, the use of mesoscale models that uh, are very well known by, our, by your teams from the past years, and then how are we are going to apply these uh, mesoscale models, which are uh, uh, models which are commonly used in all the world, and they represent the state of the art of the actual uh, air quality and meteorological modeling and how these models can be used to um, use the boundary conditions for the CFD models, computational fluid dynamic models, which are mainly applied to urban scales. So, or in other words, with a very, very high spatial resolution. So here you see uh, the city of Madrid. This is basically the main part of the downtown area. Here there is a ring called M30. So most of the monitoring stations are located in this area. And in this area, there is about 3.6 million people living. And the Madrid community is much larger and is around this, this area, which as you know, for this type of mesoscale models, we have to run with different uh, spatial resolutions, creating somehow a nesting approach, a nesting st structure. So uh, this is the first part of uh, my presentation. So you see the, the, the area. Uh, here you see some comparisons. I mean, basically, well, not comparisons, sorry, uh, some uh, monitoring data from different monitoring stations. So you see here the NO2 limit. This is the European Union limit. And this is the values provided by the monitoring stations. OK, so you see on these days, December 26 to 30, 2016, on these days, we had some kind of NO2 or NOx episodes in this case which are over the European limit. So we built our model. Our model is the model called WORFCHEM. Uh, you know, WORFCHEM is a, a model composed by a meteorological part called WORF, Weather Research and Forecasting System. This is the model that has been created about 10, 15 years ago. And uh, it was the model that substitute to the old model uh, called MM5 from uh, the end of the last century, from 1990 to uh, 2000, 2010, around that. 
The old model continues to be run and is perfectly valid. However, the new model works is uh, having much better programming, much more modern Fortran, and the capabilities, uh, software capabilities and functionalities are much higher. So you see that we build three domains, basically. We have one domain with uh, 20 kilo, 25 kilometer resolution, cover all this area. Another domain with uh, five kilometers, covering all this area, and finally, our small domain covering the municipality of Madrid. This is the same picture essentially that we saw before with one kilometer resolution. And you see here already another is very small domain called D4 with 200 times 260 vertical layers with five meter resolution. These 60 vertical layers cover up uh, after uh, over uh, 2,000 meters, which is much more than the uh, highest buildings in the in the downtown area of Madrid, particularly the financial area. So this is again what we are going to see in the second part of my presentation with the CFD. So this is basically the week we are now talking about. We have two days here for a spin up, and then we have uh, from 25 to 30, the simulation, and on these three days, the Madrid municipality government started to make some kind of traffic restrictions, reducing the traffic to odd numbers or uh, even numbers. So one day of the, the on odd uh, registration plate uh, numbers in the in the cars were allowed to 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 drive, and on the next day it was the opposite. So essentially except some specific uh, exceptions, like uh, ambulance, hospitals, etc., or policy, uh, or, or, or the police, etc., uh, then essentially the, the restrictions wanted to reduce about 50% of the, let's say, regular traffic from the individuals uh, or, uh, yeah, the, 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 the urban uh, typical traffic. Well, this is the model we have built in the last years. I think you are very familiar with that. In this case, we are using the traffic model, which is open source from Germany. It's called Sumo model that you can also use. We have been using this model so several years up to now. We have also our EBIMO model, which cover all the other anthropogenic and biogenic emissions and all the structures related to VOC specifications, emission factors, different zero weights, etc., etc. No? Uh, then we have here the WARF chem. And finally, here you have already the name of the CFD model we are going to use. It's called palm for You from Germany also. This is a very new open source uh, computational fluid dynamics models, which I recommend you to implement also in your system because it's very, very, very attractive and very powerful. Of course, it's very, very new. You have to be familiar with that, but uh, I, I, I think it's not uh, any having, uh, it's not having any problem. So some words about the sumo traffic model. You see, car following model, intersection model, lane changing model. So it's a very complete and full model. Uh, here you have some examples for one of the main cities in Madrid, in the center of the downtown. Gran Vía, Princesa, and Plaza de España. And here you see, uh, in order to apply this model on, on very, very high spatial resolution, five meters, then you have uh, you, you have to implement all the traffic lights, the times, green, red, yellow, etc., etc., for the traffic. If you have this information, which is uh, typically or regularly provided by the municipality of the city you are studying, then you can uh, run the model and obtain excellent results. Uh, this is the combination between the SUMO and the EBIMO model, which is our standard emission model for the other uh, emission uh, pollutants, etc. And then you see here how uh, we have the, uh, the, the calculations. We have a top-down approach and a bottom-up. The bottom-up approach is, is mainly used from one kilometer, Resolution, you, you remember the last 
D3, D3, the domain D3, and of course for the D4, and the traffic model sumo here, as we mentioned before. Uh, here are all the emission factors provided by the European Commission. Uh, these emission uh, factors are really uh, uh, classical, and they, you see here, they depend on the wind speed. If you go to a very high spatial resolution, you have to go to this very detailed information. So here is the expression we are got, we are using, and this is the different factors we are coming, we are bringing from the sumo model. And here are some uh, statistical data, which is very easy to obtain in, from all the countries uh, about the typ uh, typical Madrid traffic fleet. And here we have the uh, the the, the uh, structure. Of the of the of the of the WorldCat model, as I mentioned before, in order to run this model, we are starting with a global meteorological data every six hours. This is the global forecasting system, which you can download from the internet in the FTP servers in the US. This is the land use data and the anthropogenic emissions using SUMO and MIMO. Then put all together in the system WorldCat. Uh, WorldCat. Uh, includes the chemistry online. This is the difference between, between WARF and CMAC. Uh, also, uh, although, sorry, although uh, there is uh, already a, an online version uh, of the CMAC um, uh, in the recent years, uh, this is very, very, very similar. But basically, the chemical compo uh, the chemical uh, module is something like a subroutine of the all the system. So you have here a two-way feedbacks for the chemistry. Uh, you can also use this model for climate studies because you have feedback effects, feedback effects uh, from from the particular matter, for instance, or the solar radiation. So every time step, you calculate a new value based on the changes produced by the pollution. Uh, for instance, um, then we obtain the meteorological fields and finally the concentration fields, and these are the sources. This is our configuration of the system. Of course, you can use any other configuration which fits better to the area you are using. Since we are running this model since many, many years in the past, uh, mainly uh, since uh, this model was uh, released, uh, in the internet. This is the configuration we are using for the Madrid area. However, we have used our model in many different applications in China, South America, UK, etc. And you, you always require to have some, ca some kind of what, what I call calibration process. So uh, basically, uh, this is related with the emission data. When you use the classical emission data and fit, try to compare with your observations, then you can change uh, a little bit the emission information in order to adapt better to the non-linearity of the whole process. The non-linearity of all these processes is really very, 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 very high, as you will see afterwards. For instance, this is the configuration we use in a, 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 an experiment called AQME. This is an experiment between US and Europe. It was uh, coordinated by the EPA in the United States and the Joint Research Center in the ISPRA in Italy from the European Commission. And many participation, participants from Europe and the US uh, were together running North America domain and the European domain. Now we are participating in the next phase of this uh, project, is AQMA4, uh, and then the results will be obtained in the next during the next year or so. Here you see a comparison between the simulated data and the real data, and how the the the, the, the simulated data is compared with the observations. With you see a correlation coefficient a very 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 high for the average value for the tra Madrid traffic counters. This is for traffic data, of course. Uh, uh, in Madrid, we have more than three thousand traffic counters, and here you calibrate the SUMO model. This is how, how we are calibrating the SUMO model. 
This is just a picture of the area we are talking about. This is the station called Aguirre. The station Aguirre uh, is, you see, is located somehow near a park, which we will talk afterwards. And this is something like a cross uh, road area where you have big avenues, these two, and also the, the park where we, which we will talk uh, afterwards. Uh, here are, uh, you see how the traffic counters are compared for these counties. Here you see we have three counters, here, here, and here. And here you see how they are compared. They are, in this case, the comparison is not as good as in the other cases. Uh, however, uh, this is the best you can get. This is just some pictures in order to show you how the different domains are performing with this model. Average LO2 value for one day, 26 and the day 27, one day each other. This is domain one. Uh, here you see the domain two also for these two days. And here you see the domain, uh, the domain three with one kilometer resolution. Um, the comparison between the simulated NO2 and the measured NO2 for the average stations, it's like that. So you, he, you see here that we have a peak here. So uh, then we try to improve this. We added the PAL for you, CFD model, over the one kilometer resolution domain with five meters passer resolution, trying to, to get much better results for this peak. So this is the Aguirre station, Caminos station. Then you see here the comparison for that specific two stations. And then you see that the mobile is unable to capture these, these peaks. So then we are going to try to improve the simulation using the CFD model. <clears throat> so the first of all is we have two models, one kilometer and five meters. Palm model is based on the Palm. This is a famous and old model, paralyzed large energy simulation model, which is adapted to urban simulations, and it uses, of course, the Navier-Stokes equations in non-hydrostatic. The buildings are represented as solid obstacles. Natural and paved surfaces in urban environments are simulated using a multi-layer soil model. And the chemistry in this simulation, this particular experiment, we have not included the chemistry because this is one of the first preliminary experiments we have done. But the chemical, the chemistry can be included in the future. Of course, the computer time is much higher. And, all, and of course, also the demand of the computer time for these type of models is very important. Um, okay. okay. So this is just a schematic picture of how we do the nesting. We have the online nesting using the work game. Then we use the boundary conditions along the both directions, new chemical boundary conditions. The wind components are applied for these pollutants, and the six CPU hours for by day of simulation for the 200 times 200. This is five meter resolution with vertical resolution. Okay, so this is just an example how to do the 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 the, the linkage between both. Uh, models. Here we have a preliminary data uh, results. So you see that the model, you know, is capable to go up all these range when you go to this particular station. So it is unable to reach to the peak of the of the monitoring station. However, it improves substantially the simulation. Here you see. Uh, these are some cheap, uh, pictures from the CFD with five meter resolution. This is the park. This is the picture I showed you before. You remember these crossroads. And then you see here how the model uh, represents all these data. You see the complexity of the wind speeds in, in both cases. This is the difference between WorfCam and Palm for you. So all these changes here are just difference between both models. Very, very important difference. Here the same, 
in this case, um, for NO2, okay? Here, for NO2 and five meters, you see a, a picture. In fact, we have put some pictures in a GIF, animated GIF. So uh, here you see how the, uh, for the different times, uh, you see how this, the, the palm for you is doing the simulation. This is just uh, another 3D visualization of these uh, road uh, crossroads. So you see the difference are very important in all these cases and how you can see all the details in the city. These are just the difference between the work camp and the PAL for, uh, for you uh, simulation. So, uh, this model is having a very nice performance, and then you can study uh, many, many, many alternatives for a city, different types of trees, etc. in the future. For instance, in this case, let me show you another example in this presentation. Uh, the, the, the park I showed you before is using different types of trees. In this case, we are going to check the difference between broad leaves and needle leaf trees. So the park uh, I showed you before, here at the corner where we have done this experiment, is mainly built, or the park is mainly having trees with broad leaves. We are going to change these broad leaves to needle leaf trees to see the impact. So basically, this is the picture from Google Earth. This is the Retiro Park in Madrid. Remember, this was the station I showed you before, and this is the park. It's a very large park in the central part of the Madrid downtown. And, and here you see the, uh, the same picture, but, but when we change the uh, trees from needle leaves, okay? We are talking about 1,194 trees. Of course, this is a virtual experiment. When you change that and you go in details to the deposition uh, model, then you see that the surface resistance for vegetation is divided, defined like that. And then in this case, the canopy resistance minimum will be changed. From broad, this is the parameter, to needle, 500 seconds per meter, okay? This is the impact. In the case of stomatal conduct conductance in the deposition velocity, we are changing this table and this table, this table. You know the temperature, minimum temperature, maximum, and the optimal temperature. And here, the, v, the, the deposition velocity maximum from the broad and 0 0.5 in the needle edge. So you see here the difference for uh, the different, uh, the, 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 the experiment. So you see that these are the changes. We have a positive changes in all these areas. You see it's far away, in fact, because this is one kilometer, it's probably 500, 600, 800 meters from the change, from the park. Okay, because this is one kilometer. So there are substantial changes positive and negative uh, on the area because of, of the non-linearity movements of the from the navier stokes equations, from the wind and temperature and humidity, of course, in the model, okay? And here you see exactly the same, okay? Here is the value, absolute value, here are the percentages. So, I mean, changes are not very, very high, but they are far away from the, from the uh, retiro part. The same here, okay? Here you see it from the areas, and here the percentages at different times. This is 18 hour EMT, 20 similar changes, 22. And the same here with five meters, okay?
So if you take some kind, some kind of vertical cross sections from these two areas, then you will see the changes here. These are the changes due to the change in the trees in the in the in the park. So you see that the changes are very important at the local level, very important. Here you see, for instance, that there are substantial reductions in the NO2 when you change that. Okay, on average. Finally, this is just a picture uh, uh, similar to the one we saw before, but uh, in this case, using this uh, virtual experiment to change the trees from broad leaves to middle leaves. And then you see how these changes in the trees affect to all these areas far away from the park. So just changing the trees, you have impacts in all these big avenues, 800, even almost one kilometer away. Well, this is just basically my conclusions. We have run a model, uh, a very, let's say, very well-known model, WAFCAP model, with the MIMO and SUMO models. And then we have implemented and linked the CFD palm for view model. Of course, we are using the large eddy simulation. This is the, one of the advantages I didn't mention at the beginning, very important, because most of the CFD models we have used up to now in the last 15, 20 years are based on runs, Reynolds average uh, uh, approach. In this case, we use the large eddy simulation. That means that uh, in the sub-inertial sub energy cascade, we are picking up much more details, okay? <clears throat> the modeling system has been used to simulate an episode of I know two in Madrid. Uh, the work in one kilometer evaluation has been very satisfac satisfactory and the, and the model simulation covered all the boundary conditions and initial conditions from the work camp. Finally, uh, as a conclusion, general conclusion is this system, together, both models, can be used to test many different detailed uh, new patterns at city level, and it can, it, it can be used for many different applications. In this case, we have applied to improve the results of one simulation with the work camp, and also we have used it to see what will be the impact of changing the trees in a big park area in the downtown of Madrid, what will be the impact far away, even up to one kilometer away uh, from, the, from the park. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. Thank you, dear Roberto, for the very interesting presentation and uh, the nice um, uh, examples. Um, uh, at the moment, we are experiencing some technical issue with the Austrian um, uh, key speaker. And uh, if the audience have some questions, um, can we can um, um, ask you. But here next to me is Professor Ganev, and he has some questions for you. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Not really questions, actually. I haven't seen you with a beard uh, yet, <laughs> and you uh, look really uh, impressive. <laughs> like an uh, probably, or something. Thank you. Uh, congratulations Thank you. For, for the very good work, actually. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, I wonder how, uh, actually, did, did it came to the idea that the trees can be changed <laughs> in this park. Has this been done anywhere before? Or? No, no, no. Uh, uh, you know, in the, European, in the European Commission, there is a program, very important program, with more than 50 billion euros, started last year. Unfortunately, we have not been funded because we tried to get the funding from the big project. It is called Natural Based Solutions, very important. So, in other words, you have to improve the pollution using natural based solutions and for this specific program as, as i say there is an important funding for this year and for the next calls so somehow this uh, presentation is focusing to have some kind of tool to be used for these uh, applications 
Uh, but of course, we have we have not changed the the trees in Madrid. <laughs> no, brown leaves to needle leaves. Yeah. This is just an example how powerful can be the CFD in order to have details of these changes. I, I, similar, you can change the traffic, of course, any any change, and the CFD will detect the changes, which can be very important. Uh, unfortunately, we have been using this model only during the last months, unfortunately because of the pandemic. But now we are working very hard with this model at different vertical la layers also. I haven't been able to show you what is the impact at different layers. For instance, in a big building, uh, you, if you have a building of, with 10 floors or 30 floors, the changes we have seen in, in pictures in the laboratory are also very important. But this will be part of uh, another presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your um, explanations, Roberto. And now um, I would um, switch um, to our um, next speaker from Greece, who is going to present a study of the urban heat islands in Greece. Uh, and the speaker name is Tavros Kepas. Uh, he is part of the Aristotle University in Thessaloniki. So, Stavros, please uh, share your screen. Uh, hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay. So, uh, let's move to the presentation. I'm really happy that I'm here and uh, presenting this uh, uh, study, uh, which actually is in, uh, in an initial uh, stage right now. Uh, so, uh, in a second, please. So, my name is, as you said, uh, Stavros Kepos. I'm a research associate in the Laboratory of Atmospheric Physics of the School of Physics in the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. And I'm going to present you some results that have come up from uh, the project like Hasti, which focuses uh, which is uh, running right now and uh, focuses on the urban heat island effect and the extreme meteorological conditions uh, affecting urban areas, uh, which may threaten us in the future. And we will actually focus on heat waves, as we will see uh, during the presentation. So, firstly, let's have a look at the uh, outline of this presentation. Uh, we will firstly have a look at the uh, uh, definition of uh, and some traits of the urban heat island. And then there will be uh, a short um, a discussion about project like Asti. And next we will talk about tools and methods briefly describe, uh, describing the model as well that we use, uh, that was used and that we actually uh, are using right now. Uh, after that, we will have a look at some uh, results about the evaluation of the model and the future climate in the middle and at the end of the century, focusing, of course, on the urban heat island of uh, Thessaloniki in this study. And finally, we will sum up with uh, some conclusions. So, uh, this is a definition for the urban heat island. So, the urban heat island effect describes the temperature difference between an urban area and its surrounding rural areas due to human activity. So, essentially, an urban area is characterized by lack of green areas and the presence of buildings and materials absorbing heat, like uh, concrete, and polluted air due to transportation, heating, and industrial activities. So these are the human uh, activities. So uh, in this first figure, we may see a schematic representation of uh, a rural and an urban area and some critical points that affect the temperature in different ways. So briefly speaking, uh, reduced evapotranspiration uh, as the soil is covered by concrete and heat absorption and preservation due to such, due to such materials uh, lead to increased temperature, as you can see in the second figure as well. Uh, so if you look at the graph uh, on the right, uh, the dark blue line shows the uh, the, uh, so uh, uh, the, the air temperature uh, in the night, and the uh, orange uh, dust line shows the, temp the air temperature during the day. Uh, so 
in particular, in the night, the temperature difference between urban and rural areas is significant, while during the day, the urban heat island effect is almost eliminated, as you can see. So the temperature is actually similar uh, during the day in rural and urban areas. Um, so the temperature in an urban area is higher than in a, in, a, in a suburb during the night, and as a result, the daily temperature range of an urban region is much, much smaller and rarer, as you can see here. So the difference between the uh, blue and the orange uh, graph is uh, not that much. Um, and here is how the urban heat island affects humans during heat waves, according to a study analyzing the heat wave and their impact in Shanghai, in the city of Shanghai. Uh, this graph refers to the city of, of Shanghai, as I said, and uh, displays an excessive mortality rate in, in the urban area, indicated by large urban heat island intensity in X axis, against the excess uh, mortality, which is in Y axis. It is noticeable that during a prolonged heat wave in 1998, as you see here, a, a, this uh, data set uh, with blue uh, dots. Um, they observed 27 deaths per 100,000 people uh, in the urban area, compared to just seven uh, in regions outside the city center. The possible reasons for these results are the increased thermal stress in residents and the concentration of uh, uh, large amounts of smoke and air pollutants due to meteorological conditions, such as the anticyclonic uh, conditions. We, uh, of course, uh, this is a situation which is quite hard in, uh, within the urban area. Uh, so, in the next three slides, we'll have a generic look at the project Life Asti. So, initially, there were two replication cities, uh, Thessaloniki and Rome. Uh, however, um, we added Heraklion as well, because it is one of the largest cities in Greece. It is in south, uh, being affected almost directly by African air masses, and of course, it is a popular touristic destination. Uh, the, the project started in 2018 and will totally last three years, and here is a list with the project impl implementers. You may see there's the University of Thessaloniki, uh, which is the coordinator, uh, while other research institutions, companies, and authorities from Italy and Greece are involved. So some goals, uh, some of the goals of the Life Asset Project uh, are presented here. Uh, in the framework of a Life Asset Project, excuse me, there are operational forecasts providing uh, meteorological variables and related indices, uh, such as uh, uh, some in indices about the, uh, the comfort that people um, feel uh, under specific conditions, meteorological conditions. And by the end of this project, our goal is to provide this information in a spatial resolution of 250 meters. Uh, the complete tool will be supported by uh, a dense network of weather stations in the cities, in and around the cities, actually, and uh, will provide alerts in extreme situations such as heat waves. And of course, this will be available online. Actually, it has already been available online on uh, this link that you can see here, app.lifeasty.eu. Further actions that uh, further actions uh, included in the uh, this project are the simulation of future climate, which, for which we will talk uh, in a bit, and how this will affect uh, the urban heat island effect in the uh, Mediterranean cities. In addition, uh, we plan to make some sensitivity tests in order to suggest solutions about how to combat urban heat island in these cities. Um, I would like to show you an example here that some actions may include greening of areas within uh, the cities, 
which may help uh, to combat these effects. Uh, so, uh, this is a schematic representation of the process taking place in the process. Like Hasty, uh, the work model runs uh, in, an in an operational basis, and in this table on the right, you may see uh, the physics parameterization schemes that are used right now. Uh, and let me note that we get data from the DFS model in order to use them as initial data for the work model. Uh, from this representation, from this uh, scheme here, I would like to highlight the presence of a single layer urban canopy model in order to simulate the effect of urban geomorphology on the dynamic radiation and thermodynamic processes. Uh, the final model output will be, processed, will be processed by a downscale algorithm uh, which is under development in order to better simulate the urban uh, environment and check how the green areas may affect and change the meteorology and the climate and the microclimate of uh, the city. So we hope that the fine resolution of 2,000, two, excuse me, 250 meters will help us to understand much better the way that the city acts and behaves during extreme events like um, heat waves. So our final goal is to provide populations with a useful tool which will mostly work as a heat health warning system being available by, via um, a web and mobile devices. So now let's move on the topic of today's presentation. Uh, the study area is Central Macedonia of Greece, in, including the city of Thessaloniki in the middle. Uh, let me say a few words about the, uh, the, about the city of Thessaloniki. It is the second largest city of Greece uh, with 824,000 urban inhabitants. It is, lo it is located uh, along the northeast coast of the Timaeus Gulf. Uh, the annual mean temperature is around 16 degrees Celsius. The annual mean relative humidity is a bit high, 62%. Dominant wind direction is uh, northwest uh, with an average speed of 5.6 meters per second. However, the city is often affected by some sea breeze, especially during the summertime. Uh, finally, the annual precipitation is around 450 millimeters. So Thessaloniki actually belongs to the zone of the Mediterranean climate with hot and dry summers. Uh, especially, uh, sorry, and mild and wet winters. Uh, <clears throat> so let's move to the next slide. And in this slide, there are two figures showing the domain set in the work model and used broadly for the applications of the Life Aspect Project, but also for the purposes of this study, of the current study. Uh, this large domain includes Northern Africa, and most of, of Europe uh, with a resolution of 18 kilometers, while the second domain focuses on the eastern uh, Mediterranean Sea, and then the third, the fourth, and uh, the fifth domains uh, have a spatial resolution of two kilometers, focusing on the, uh, the cities of interest, which are Rome, Thessaloniki, and Heraklion. The second figure shows the land use in the domain of Thessaloniki, and you can clearly see the urban area here uh, with reddish colors. And the uh, agricultural rural, rural area, area uh, which surrounds the city uh, with these yellow, yellowish, brownish colors. So uh, firstly, we will try to make a simple evaluation of the model. Uh, using an urban uh, weather station within the urban fabric, uh, which is actually located uh, on Martillo, Martillo Road. Uh, we use some statistics to achieve this. The first is the mean bias error, which captures the average bias in the, in the uh, prediction. The second is mean absolute error. The third is root mean squared error, which is uh, the squared root of the average of squared errors. The uh, fourth is the correlation coefficient, and the fifth is the index of agreement, uh, which shows how well the, the simulations 
uh, matches the observation. So let's have a look at the, at the results. Uh, here we can see some, some statistics for the meteorological station on Multi Road, uh, which is a, a high density area with significant lack of parking trees, as you can see in the print screen uh, from Google Earth. Uh, we simulated a heat wave occurred uh, within uh, 29, 29th of June of 2017, uh, and lasted actually for four days. Uh, so I'm focusing on specific results, which are the uh, uh, mean absolute error, correlation coefficient, the index of agreement, uh, and in red boxes, you can see the suggested thresholds of these indices for a successful simulation. As you can see, all the three indices are within the accepted uh, values, and we may say that the model can simulate fairly efficiently the conditions in this uh, specific region. So here, uh, we may have a look at the, the observations of the Martillo station with the red solid line in the, first, in the uh, left graph. Uh, and we can notice that the temperature almost reached 40 degrees Celsius, not dropping below 27 degrees Celsius in the night for four days. Here is the four-day period of the uh, heat wave. And uh, you can see with blue solid line the, uh, the output of the, of the world model. Uh, so it is clear that there is an overestimation of the maximum temperature here and the underestimation of the minimum temperature. However, in the next graph, uh, the, the right graph, uh, there is a fair agreement of the, uh, the way that real observations and simulated temperatures uh, change through the day. And here we may see uh, uh, exactly the same thing. In the first graph here, uh, it is clearly displayed the fact that the maximum temperatures are overestimated during the heat wave, which is an impact on the daily average uh, temperatures as shown in the second graph. So, uh, now we will move to the last part of this study, which is about the future climate and how it will affect the urban heat island in Thessaloniki. The work, mo the work model uh, uses similar schemes, again, to what we previously described. Uh, the domains are similar, but the resolution of the domains is different. Um, it's 50 kilometers for the large domain of Europe, 10 kilometers for the East Mediterranean domain, and 2 kilometers, this is the same, for the city's uh, domains. And this is because we used CMIT5 uh, boundary conditions with a resolution which is quite high. Uh, I mean, it's quite low, actually. Uh, it's quite coarse, uh, with one degree uh, for the RCP 8.5 scenario, or in other words, the worst case scenario. So we use the, the worst case scenario or the business as usual scenario. We simulated three five year periods uh, in order to compare them together. The reference period, as you see here, is uh, the 2006-2010 uh, period and the two future periods uh, which are simulated are the 2046-2050 and 2096-2100. So in the next few slides we will briefly, briefly analyze um, the heat wave days today and in the rest of the current, of the current century. Uh, we use these two criteria that you can see here. Is the, um, so when the maximum temperature is larger than 37 degrees Celsius and the daily average temperature is larger than 31 degrees Celsius, then uh, this is determined as a heat wave day. So we chose two points for uh, this presentation, uh, extracting data from the work output and we, we will compare them in the next few slides. The one point is within the urban area, and you can see here is actually in this, almost in the city center. Uh, and the second 
is close to Lichanyona, which is here, uh, is a rural area south of Thessaloniki. Both points are considered by the model as points close to the sea, actually they are close to the sea, with an altitude of around 33 meters. In the graph on the right, we can see that the number of heat wave uh, days in both points for the reference period are 13 and 4, the green, uh, in and out of the city. So you can see that there is an excess uh, of the heat wave days in uh, the urban area, a number which will be doubled by 2050, and we will be 11 to 16 times more by 2100, exceeding actually, as you see here, 150 heat wave days in the urban area. So let's make some uh, more comparisons between these two uh, points, the urban and the reference point. Here we have two graphs, two graphs for each of two points showing, showing the distribution of the maximum and minimum temperatures. So these two graphs with uh, reddish colors uh, are for the urban area, and these two with greenish colors um, refer to the reference uh, area. Uh, the two, the upper graphs are for uh, maximum temperature, and the uh, other two are for minimum temperature. So different periods uh, are displayed by different shades of same colors, to so dark red to uh, light red. During the reference period, so 2006 2010, uh, there were not many heat wave days with maximum temperature larger than 40 degrees Celsius. Actually, we didn't have so much, so many uh, cases. But in the future, uh, not the 9% and 24% of the heat wave days will present maximum temperatures larger than 40 degrees Celsius, uh, which is a significant change, OK? Uh, the trend is similar for both reference and urban points. However, it seems that in the urban area, the minimum temperature will be fairly problematic, as by 2100, it will not drop below 30 degrees Celsius in the 63% in the of the heat wave days. In contrast, this percentage will be just 20% in the reference uh, point, so in the rural area. And so this, com this discomfort within the urban environment, uh, especially during the uh, early in the morning, uh, is clearly depicted by the graph in this uh, slide. So, Discomfort index, this is discomfort index, which is calculated by the formula shown on the side, involves um, uh, both temperature and relative humidity variables. So in case of minimum discomfort index, so you can see here with pale colors for urban with red and uh, reference uh, for, uh, for the uh, rural area, uh, you can see that uh, this discomfort index will be uh, larger by 0 0.5 degrees Celsius in the urban area compared to the reference point in the future. And another uh, interesting finding here is the fact that by 2100, the average discomfort index uh, during the heat waves, uh, these two lines here in the middle, uh, will make most of people uh, suffer discomfort. So we actually change class. Uh, from uh, this one, which is uh, larger than 50% uh, percent of population feels discomfort, will go to something like, uh, let's say, more discomfort. So heat waves will be, uh, will feel like uh, more discomfort in the future. Finally, we will talk about the urban heat island intensity. On the left, uh, we uh, may see the frequency of the intensity of the heat island effect in the Salniki at zero UDC, so uh, early in the morning or late at night. In general, in the future, in most cases, difference between the rural and the urban areas, um, or in other words, the intensity of uh, the urban heat island will remain around two to three degrees Celsius. With some, case, with some cases of intensity up to 
plus 5 degrees Celsius. Uh, so this is the difference between the, uh, uh, the urban and the rural uh, area. And um, uh, however, at 12 UTC, so in the afternoon, or uh, in, while in most cases, the intensity of the heat island will be around 1 and 2, uh, 0 to 2 degrees Celsius, it seems that there will be an increasing trend in cases that intensity will be larger than 3 uh, degrees Celsius. And these two last graphs, we investigate the maximum urban heat island intensity. On the left, we see that the, that the daily maximum uh, intensity now, so in the reference period, is around 2 to 4 degrees Celsius, but by 2,100, it will distribute in a wide, in a wider range, uh, mostly between 2 and 7 degrees Celsius. So this is the, uh, the, the maximum intensity of the Amazon Island. And on the right figure, we see uh, when uh, the maximum intensity occurs in the day, during the day. So at the present, there is a preference between 0 and 3 UTC. There are some cases in uh, the afternoon. Uh, so it, we, this is not very clear. However, in the future, this preferential period will be wider, and in particular, between uh, 15 UTC and 3 UTC. So actually, uh, during the afternoon, uh, evening, uh, late in the night, or early in the morning, with many cases of maximum intensity uh, occurring in uh, the afternoon. So uh, let's have some conclusions. Of, we made the evaluation, uh, an evaluation of the war model, a simple evaluation, I would say. Uh, we compare the urban uh, meteorological station, the observation uh, of the station in the urban area uh, during a heat wave period uh, between uh, 20, actually uh, uh, late June to early uh, July in 2017, which was simulated by uh, the WARP model. And uh, we may say that the uh, simulation was quite successful. Uh, at least statistically, uh, with the mean absolute error being less than 1.2, the correlation coefficient, correlation coefficient being uh, larger than 0 0.92, and the index of agreement being larger than 0 0.94. However, in some cases, uh, the maximum temperature was overestimated by 2 degrees Celsius, and the uh, minimum temperature was was underestimated by around 1.5 degrees Celsius. And finally, uh, regarding the future simulation uh, based on uh, the uh, worst case scenario, the heat wave days are expected to be uh, doubled by 2050 and be 11 to 16 times more by 2100. Uh, both maximum and minimum temperatures uh, of, uh, during heat wave days in and out of the city of Sonegi will increase. However, the, the minimum temperature within the urban area in 2100 will be in more than half of the cases larger than 30 degrees Celsius, which will uh, make the whole condition quite discomfort. Uh, the urban heat island intensity in future remains continues now around 1 to 3 degrees Celsius, but with some occasions by 2100 uh, of intensities larger than 3 uh, degrees Celsius, and in, in some extreme cases even larger than 6 degrees Celsius, especially in the afternoon. Uh, and finally, the maximum uh, urban heat island intensity is usually around 2 to 4 degrees Celsius, but uh, demonstrating a wider range in the future. So the daily period of the occurrence of the maximum urban heat island intensity seems to broaden in the future uh, in, a, in a wide range of uh, uh, times around uh, the day, uh, with many occurrences, though, uh, during the afternoon. 
So thank you very much for your attention. Please follow Life Update. Uh, visit our uh, website, as you can see here, and follow our Facebook, our YouTube channel, uh, Twitter account, Instagram account, uh, our LinkedIn, and Research Gate uh, account as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stavros, for the interesting presentation. Um, we just checked that our YouTube channel doesn't really have uh, questions for the keynote speakers. So we would like to thank you both, Roberto and Stavros, uh, for being our keynote speakers. And hopefully next year to see you uh, in person for the next edition of our conference, uh, which is going to be between 1st and 3rd of June. Uh, so, uh, with that, I would uh, close the, um, the opening uh, session and um, we have five minutes for a break and we will continue with the two parallel sessions. Thank you once again to all. Bye-bye.